Generally, introducing a guest speaker involves summarizing that speaker's professional biography. But when the speaker's written his own biography in the form of a memoir as complex, raw, and resonant as Hook, he kind of doesn't leave you much to say. So thanks a lot, Randall. You're a really hard act to follow. Randall Horton has had a professional biography, or perhaps we should say biographies, about as hugely varied as we can imagine. His roles has ranged, to quote Professor Horton himself here, quote, from college student to homeless drug addict to international cocaine smuggler to inmate and finally college professor. And to that list, we can add social justice advocate and prize-winning poet. And as you'll hear and as I learned you know, about 20 minutes ago, member of a jazz band that has just come back from touring in Gdansk, Berlin, and The Hague. So, and Randall's not even jet lagged. Um, <laughs> Professor Horton's awards, many awards, include the Gwendolyn Brooks Poetry Award, the B. Gonzalez Poetry Award, and the National Endowment of the Arts Fellowship in Literature. Among his writings are three collections of poetry. But today, it's his memoir, Hook, winner of the GLCA New Writers Award for Creative Nonfiction, that Professor Horton will be sharing with us in a talk called more than seven felonies from prison to PhD. In his poem, A Reoccurring Nightmare and Maximum Security, <coughs> Professor Horton writes about, quote, the prison you have become, a longer extension of the cell in which all humans are born. Confronting his life's narrative with blunt bravery and startling lyricism, Randall Horton's memoir book describes what it takes to become your own prison and what it takes to make you free. Please join me in welcoming Randall Horton. Answer the phone at 10 p.m. Offer a reserved hello on a nebulous night filled with palace snow in Harlem. Respond with okay. Listen. Be attentive when you learn he died in the hell of gunfire at the intersection of Minnesota Avenue and East Capitol Street in the nation's capital. After thinking that's fucked up, thank your old college roommate for calling. Ignore that he greeted you as Hook, the nickname you went by in the streets. Hang up. You can and you can't believe the truth simultaneously. Write D-I-S-C-O in your leather journal. Maybe this will immortalize the image. You will never forget him, but you have already forgotten Hook. Before the blackbird echoes, bangs against your window sill, wake up. Go directly to the mahogany desk between two windows. Sit in the brown swivel chair. Stare at the building opposite your building. Rearrange papers that don't need rearranging twice. Open your journal to the name written last night, Disco. Remember the cell doors opening after serving 18 months for three felonies in Fairfax County Adult Detention Center. Five hours after that release, meet Disco Willing and ATM through your basement on a handcart. Out of the wall with metal chain and pickup truck, he had pulled the money machine. He did that. This is your introduction. Turn on the computer. Type Theodore Blanford in the search box. Click the magnifying glass. Expect to be surprised even though you know what the results will bring. Don't be surprised when you scroll to Maryland Devil Homicide Suspect Shot Killed in D.C. One lone bird outside your window flies backwards at an indeterminate rate of speed while the world moves forward. The bird is red. Look for balance in the oddity. Note that double homicide is five syllables. Five deliberate pauses before damn. Remember you knew the suspect shoot a killer. Suspend court in your imagination. Add four indeterminate words to formulate the phrase whole court in the street. This is how he would die. Holding court in the streets. Prophetic. After reading that the now deceased wife had wanted a divorce, deduced it was because of drugs. Visualize the wife and sister just before death in their devil wide. Try to make sense of blood spilled on the carpeting, the red is deafening, scream. Wait for the buzz to stop because someone rang the wrong buzzer. There's always an echo after the buzzing, even after it buzzes again, don't answer. It is not for you. Keep reading the online article, but more specifically the phrases 
forcible entry and protective order. Acknowledge that your friend was a suspect in his first wife murder too. A dead body in the trunk. Two days after, two days later while driving to school to teach called short man because it takes that long to find someone to talk about tragedy. Tell short man who is a barber and has 10 years behind Razor while tucked in his memory what happened. Agree in unison that prison would turn the brain into a hum. Agree again that prison taught you to be a better criminal, though you both digress. Both of you understand the term anomaly, but admit that disco was a composite of many men who never learned to be a man. You would then ask the question for the first time, why? Return back home from New Haven before rush hour traffic begins to bottleneck the Cross County Parkway. Dig through the closet for the first version of your memoir. Disco rolled the safe out of the department store. The first lines of the paragraph read, Go to the next page where he loves to pull the trigger of a gun more than he loves touching the torso of a woman. Flip to the page where he and his sister distribute lead bullets through the windshield and the impressions of circular holes when the discarded lead pierces the glass are swift and pronounced. The body is a question mark. He tried to run over his wife with his truck and then threatened her with a claw hammer. She told the police, ask yourself why this sign didn't signify violence. What theory would Ferdinand de Saussure classify this under? Put the manuscript back in the closet. Don't beat yourself up because you knew he was a killer and said nothing to nobody. Forget the double negative your mom would correct you on and tell yourself it's nature versus nurture. Justify your silence in saying that the world you once lived in was filled with silence and mayhem. That is why they called you Hook. Don't block Audrey Lords. Your silence would not protect you from your mind. Pretend this is penance. Wake up the next morning. Go back to the computer. Press any key to erase the black screen. Ignore the blackbirds outside your window while telling yourself this is the last time. You need to forget. But before you do, one more search. Click Inmate Violent Death in the News. A flood of blackbirds appear suspended in animation at the top right corner of the web page. Ignore them, but don't. Tell yourself this is not karma Edgar Allan Poe style. He did not want her to leave. She wanted him to go. Said he needed treatment. Think back to 12-step literature that cautions about the 13th step, sexual fraternization with people inside the circle. Feel confident in assuming she was a recovering addict and understood addictive behavior. Two addicts don't make a right. Tell yourself this. Read about the interaction with police who failed to notice the inevitable. Admit the judicial system is failing to protect women. I am victim was tattooed on her forehead, yet she remained invisible to the patriarchs, the ones sworn to protect and serve. Ask yourself, does his death matter more than the victim's death? Convince yourself the race never stops running, that memory will eat you alive. Say, I am a changed man, but no one will hear you. Get back into bed, pull the covers over your face, remember to dream, forget Hook, wake up tomorrow and feel guilty again. All right. How y'all doing, man? Y'all all right? Everybody all right? How y'all doing today? Good. All right, I figured I'd just get right into it. Y'all didn't mind. You know, I just wanted to pop right in. Just checking to make sure we got a pulse going. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so I'm reading today the night from Hook, uh, which is a memoir um, that I wrote um, that came out in the end of 2015 and beginning of 2016. Um, for those of you who haven't sort of read the book, and some for those of you who of you who have, I sort of recap a little bit in terms of what the book. It's sort of how the construction of it and what's it about. Um, so, so the book, the memoir, sort of chronicles my time, sort of uh, on the streets of Washington D.C., from on the cusp of like being a college um, college kid who gets sort of introduced to this whole world of drugs and um, this whole other world that you could never imagine, but got sucked into, and. Um, and how that that world, you know, took him inside out and upside down, and um, you know, chewed him up and spit him out at the same time. Sometimes um, it's interesting. It's interesting life. 
Um, but, you know, I sort of try to chronicle that, what it was really like in terms of the 80s, in terms of the crack, wave of crack, uh, at the epidemic, and sort of how that manifests itself in the 80s um, through South America, through Bahamas, into Miami, in terms of that, that whole pipeline. Um, but also there's, you know, like I said, the tragedy, and talk, I talk about, you know, homelessness, addiction, um, and ultimately incarceration, right? Um, you don't escape that. You know, you just don't. And so, um, or either you die, one, two. I don't know, I've been, I was doing this a long time, and that, that's the only choices I know. I've seen my peers to this point. No one success, successfully made it out. So, um, incarceration, you know, sort of like, put a fire up under me in a lot of ways because I let so many people down in my life. I wasn't too much di different from, you know, you guys sitting here, man. I went to Howard University. Um, my, both of my parents were school teachers. Um, it's interesting sometimes when I come into situations like this, people think I had a whole different existence than what I had. I didn't come from no, I, didn't, I wasn't like quote unquote the ghetto. I didn't come from this whole thing where I feel like I'm some kind of victim of some kind of miscarriage just other than what society gives me. I can't even know that. However, you know, um, I think sometimes that narrative gets lost and that, you know, wherever you are in life, it's easy to fall into those cracks and crevices and get sucked up into something, right? Um, and then you find, you look, you look up one day and you find that you got seven felonies, man. Um, and then you're like, what am I gonna do with my life? Like, what am I gonna do? Like, you're sitting in the, you're sitting in the, you're sitting in the jail cell in Hagerstown, Maryland, and you have seven felonies, and you're like, okay, is my life over? I don't know. I don't think so. I feel breathing. And so, for me, that process began right in incarceration and it began with sort of me understanding that I could take, put pen to paper and sort of express my feelings in ways in which I had never learned to do uh, growing up and trying to be a young man. Um, because I grew up in, you know, the places I was and the kind of places I cohabitated in, you know, expressing your feelings and showing that part of what you were just wasn't a part of the equation. And so it became very hard for me to do that. But one of the things I found out is when I began to write, um, when I began to write about my experiences and the things that I had done to myself and other people, um, there was a sort of freedom in that, right? There was a sort of freedom in that. Um, but how, did I, how could I say that, that freedom that I was writing about in a jail cell would sort of be my, sort of like have me here today sitting here talking to you? I couldn't have never imagined that, but it didn't matter. You know, I had to start with the single most thing that gave me some kind of satisfaction in this world that was positive, and that was it. Um, and so um, I began to sort of write when I was in prison. Um, and when I was released, um, and we'll talk a little bit, maybe I'll read a couple, I'm gonna read a couple of sections. Um, I was released, I had about 15 years total, <clears throat> and so, I was in the state of Maryland. The state of Maryland is one of the few states that allow what they call is a motion for reconsideration of sentence. And so um, I applied for that, and uh, I was eventually allowed to go to a program in North Carolina after five years. And then I stayed there for two years, and I went back to Washington, D.C., and decided to get my degree, um, my bachelor's. And that by that time I had been writing, um, and I was trying to figure out what it, what it meant to be a poet, <clears throat> and I didn't know. Um, but one of the things I used to do was write writers while I was inside. I would write, I would read their books, and I would write them. I found out what I would get the address and try to figure it out. And there was a few that wrote me back that we're still friends to this day. <clears throat> um, a couple of them have given me blurbs: E. Alphabert Miller, Marita Golden, a fiction writer. Um, you know, and so. It was, you know, it was a process of sort of trying to find people to mentor me, um, and at the same time, trying to figure out how am I going to make a living writing. Like I don't understand that. And then also, I mean, how am I going? But <clears throat> let me back up. I believe it or not, I felt the I felt that the university setting or a college setting or a place where there was a free exchange of ideas would be a better place for me to start, right? 
I'm here. So, but <laughs> and so here's the irony, right? So I teach at University of New Haven, and all of my, most of my, my, my students are criminal justice majors, right? This is the irony, like, the never forgive, never forgive, you know, it doesn't. Because I can remember the prosecutor saying, Mr. Your Honor, Mr. Hart has had 20, 30 something years to get his life together. He had done nothing. We don't think he should ever do anything but stay and go back to prison. That's what he told me. I, mean, I remember like it was yesterday. Um, and so I, that irony is never lost to me. I, like every day I smile. But it's good too, though, because I realize I'm in the place where I need to be, um, given you know a lot of things what's going on. Like we need to sort of change the face, <clears throat> the face of what it means to have been incarcerated, right? And what does that necessarily mean? Coming out to someone you know who's demanding the same equal access as other people who have done you know things that just didn't get arrested, you know. One of the things I had to learn. When I got out of prison, it was not to beat myself up too much about life. Because life is going to touch you whether you go to prison or not. I promise you it will. It will. And so I'm not going to sit here and feel guilty about my life. I can feel guilty about the things I did. And I'm sorry for them and I apologize for them. But each and every one of us go through something. And we've gone through some shit. Some things that we don't even want to talk about good or bad. So everybody's dealing with their own thing. So I'm not going to like, you know, so I had to learn that because, you know, in early on I would be in these spaces. I'm like, everybody's looking at me because I'm the one. But, you know, only time and confidence and, you know, writing about those things helped me get over that. You know, and then they're doing a few things too every now and then, publishing a bit, trying to do some, some work. Anyway, let me shut up. <laughs> um, so, read another little piece and then I'm going to bring in um, so my book is situated, I'm, these, these letters so it's an epistle, an epistle form right, anybody know what I mean when I say epistle what, who, who, who knows I'm putting y'all on the spot right now <laughs> let me find out back in the, no it's, it's letters, it's letters I'm sorry, I saw your hand <laughs> You didn't want to be the one, I don't know. <laughs> so the book of, so these letters is go back and forth between me and this woman. At the time she's incarcerated in Brooklyn Federal Detention Center. Uh, we, had, we had been friends when I was getting my PhD in SUNY Albany. And um, she went through this whole thing um, and found herself incarcerated. But, in, but we, came, we became friends because we were both formerly incarcerated. And she, you know, she was getting her undergrad, I was getting my PhD, but we remained friends. And I got a call one day and she was locked up. And so we started this, you know, through no fault of our own. It was a whole, it was a thing of wrong place, wrong time. And they ended up keeping up about three years because of that. Uh, but we, we exchanged letters back and forth, right? Um, and the memoir, or the things that sort of happen in my life become are these flashbacks that sort of appear to her in, in mail call, right? Um, so they flash back to these sort of moments and then you come back into the present, into our conversation. So um, before I start that, I want to um, finish one little piece from... Um, hold on a second. Yeah. In the first section, and sort of this, sort of like being sort of like I'm leaving this whole college thing behind because I've been caught up in these drug things. But this is actually where the journey begins at the lowest point. Um, we'll start here. Exodus 1983, December 1983. Coal is a dreadful thing. Say I hop the turnstile with two dollars in my pocket. There's an art to busy oneself to pass time. In the back corner of the last subway car from D.C. to the outer skirts of northern Virginia, then back over the Potomac River into a subway hole where I want the end of time to eat me alive. Say the sky's falling or fell yesterday. Nowhere to run and options do not exist when flashing red lights produce a siren inside your head. Here's where the narrative clutters, events entering and exiting swift, the fall hardened in 4-4 time, the metal slide off of a five-string guitar echoing your ear. 
A sudden fool's melody lifts you up and then a downdraft of beat flats escorts you closer to the blues. One decision after another, disasters in so much as dreams are not real. As in everything's a magician's trick, well I would never guess which hand the silver coin is in, yet I try, yet I fail. Addiction grabs hold of the body, everything zooming at the speed of sound threaded through a needle's head. Free bass amplifying that sound, louder and louder, incorrigible. Two women in an apartment performing sexual acrobatics on me to each other, we all in. Sweat dripping down the bridge of my nose onto the mirror, one droplet at a time. The rock is holy. Start naked females dance seductively inside the mirror's reflection. Cage the outside world along with its problems, place pebble and stem. Sizzle, then last one, last one, the last one. Believe this lie, if only for a moment. It is never the last. Man's weakness hangs between his legs. Come on in, baby. Have a seat. Let me take your coat, boo. Jesse got a fine friend. He sent you, huh? Lucky us. What you need to drink? We got cognac. Want to smoke before you go? You don't need nothing, boo. Let's take it to the bedroom. What's your name again, sugar? Open the snow seal. Last one. Last one. The last one. Mixed with baking soda, hear the vial rattling product along with the brain around and around. Place pebble and stem sizzle, then fall into the ravine alongside the seductive bodies all night. Fantasies fulfilled. The only requirement, make the beige pebble appear, then disappear. What's yours is theirs in a matter of hours. We smoke until not even the crumbs were left because the rock is holy. Say I walk inside a swarm of noontime pedestrians unaware of the locality of the living. In order to end, you have to begin, and I was between going and stop. I could not tell you if birds pipe strange trajectories or if the wind howls when the sun is a full orb. Say the clothes on my body were on my body yesterday and the day before. I could not tell you the time of day or the month because time and space were inconsequential. Routines terrible the mind. When you do nothing but poison the body, every day becomes a test to see how close to the threshold of death you can venture before receding back. Every wrong decision and deal culminated with seeking refuge in Tony's dorm room when he traveled to Whiteville for Christmas break because there was nowhere in the city to call home. I crashed briefly with Jesse and his girlfriend in the studio apartment on 16th Street but pride made me leave after a week because I didn't want to tell him. Two women seduced me into smoking my entire supply in one night. I wandered aimlessly for days, sleeping anywhere I could, a closet, a hallway, a car, the train, and finally Tony's room. There were no brakes to slow down the collision with catastrophe, so I sped up full speed, preparing for the inevitable train wreck. Hidden in the darkened room for two days straight, I could not hear Christmas bells jingling nor distance carols sung. No holiday cheer for the attic tucked inside a room in the fetal position, trying to sleep away the wretchedness and the uncertainty. On the third day of self-reflection, I gathered the courage to call my parents and humbly ask for a bus ticket home for good. The city had eaten its young and spit its cartilage out onto the hard carcass of the street. Four months after returning home, I received a phone call from Cat Daddy, first forgiving me for running off with his package, then reporting that whipping radar had fired seven bullets at point-blank range into Jesse's skull with a 357 Magnum. Evidently, that hadn't been enough because when Jesse's girlfriend discovered the body coming home from her swing shift, she found his six-foot frame submerged in the bathtub, electrocuted by a plugged-up iron thrown in the bloody water. The violent death prompted Craig's move back to Miami. Patrick and Tony returned to school, leaving the drug game behind. And here, here is where my narrative begins. So I'm gonna bring Elle in right quick, see what she has to say. I may read one in response to her. Sometimes it's kind of funny reading these. Um,
heart is so many letters to you and I never finish. It's not because I'm lazy. I just want my letters to be neat and coherent. A part of me feels like I told you too much and even though you asked me, and you didn't expect me to be open and honest. I apologize that I make you feel guilty for asking me to share my past with you. That wasn't my intention. I trust you and I'm not ashamed to bear it all. Something deep inside lets me know regardless of what I tell you, you wouldn't judge me. When I received the Bell Hooks book, All About Love, that you sent me, I started reading it immediately. And the lady blew me away. She helped me look at love differently with understanding. I've always known the type of love I've experienced and witnessed in my life has been twisted. But she explained why. And it made perfect sense. All I've ever seen in my life is abuse. I grew up in a dysfunctional household. But then again, who did it? What is a normal household? For one thing for certain, abuse is normal to me. I've always believed deep down that love could not exist without pain, physical, emotional, psychological. That's bullshit. I just didn't know any better, because I've never seen anyone in a loving relationship that didn't have a big dose of abuse, mainly verbal. I'm not only talking couples. I'm talking families, brothers, sisters, all relationships. I really like the book. I understand my family better and why I made the same mistakes without realizing it. I need to learn how to stop the vicious cycle of abuse. I want to teach my son love doesn't have to hurt to be real. Respect shouldn't be expected from someone who loves you. I want to teach him to be a good man. First, I need to learn how to define what a good man is. I always thought my father was a good man, but he is flawed and mistreats my mother regularly. I mean, they talk to each other fucked up, but they will never leave each other. It's crazy because that's one of the reasons I thought he was good, because despite all the fights, he never left. And most of my friends grew up without a dad. I've been praying a lot more and reading the Bible. I'm striving for peace and it's working. I'm taking care of a few plants and I'm singing to them now. Don't laugh. I know it sounds silly, but it works. They are growing and green, so green they look fake. The light I carry inside me is feeding them and it shows. They also started an ASL class twice a week. I still tutor some of the girls and they are getting better at English every day. I'm also trying to start a GED class. I offered to teach the class. I'm just waiting to get approved by the educational director. I found a Colombian lady who is good at math, so we plan on teaming up to help the girls. I'm reading two books that help me teach students who are English speakers. Most of the girls who want help with the GED prep class are Spanish. Many came to America in their early teens and have problems mastering the language. Of course, many understand Spanish more than English, but not enough to take the GED in Spanish. It's a little frustrating because I wonder what they were doing in school all this time. Many got placed in bilingual classes and many were passed for good behavior. These books are teaching me common problems to look out for. I can't wait to teach them how to write an essay. I love teaching the basic essay format. I like the way the writer lights up when they learn how to write an introduction and when they really get the meaning of a thesis. It's such a cool experience. It's like watching them communicate on paper with confidence. I'll let you know how and if they let me start the class. Remember the pregnant girl? Well, she had the baby. She was able to spend two days with him. The poor girl had a C-section. When she came back, everyone tried to help out. I eventually got around to asking her about the experience, and she told me how nice the officers were to her, and how some of them even carried the baby. I asked her what was the first thing she said, and she shocked me with, is the baby icy? And yes, she's a beautiful African-American girl with caramel skin. I didn't question why she asked that question, because I didn't want to irritate or offend her. I immediately thought about you when I thought about my birthing experience. When I gave birth, my main concern was if the baby was okay. Color was an issue. I also used the journal you sent to write a response piece to your piece about almost shooting, oh boy. I will mail it next week. I will write to you again soon. Out. <laughs> Give you a little bit of L's voice. Dear L, we script our lives on reaction rather than action, meaning daily life is always in response to or reply to a command or demand. The world does this, uses us in that way. 
the after sound of oppression. We know this maxim, yet we become willing participants in our own commodification. The world does this, it holds us down. Then too, I've been thinking about the question you pose with regard to women and believing. Perhaps images and how we as a society nurture young women creates this insecurity. The American dream chokes little girls in so much as not all of them will be able to live up to idea of beauty as constructed by benefactors of the dominant narrative, those who dictate the ebb and flow of how we live. Beauty is a dangerous thing, and understand brown and black women historically bear the weight of civilization in addition to their own, which we can be daunting at times. But more than that, the male plays a role in this insecurity, especially in these so-called streets, by his rejection of the woman as equal counterpart and anything other than sexual object. We just want to love and have some warm body love us back. Objectification is a delicate balance. In other words, I saw this objectification play out with men who dominated women to the point they broke their spirits and sold their sound. The women couldn't speak of their own oppression because they possessed no language to express the unimaginable, reminding me of pudding and the streetwalker Sunshine. Sunshine adored pudding so much she strolled around Logan Circle in D.C. every night, selling the one commodity she knew well, herself. Here's the oxymoron. Sunshine never saw the light. Darkness choked her to death. She never got to understand we are the shadows in the dark that Toni Morrison imagines. Our sound originates from the breaking of sound. And then again, like life, language is only the beginning, and perhaps in its death too, comes a new beginning, a new language, L. Tonight, I'm imagining with exact description the six by nine cell you sleep in, in all its isolation, because this is something memory lets me reinvent. The gray cinder block, the dull silver glow from the metal toilet, I have been thinking long and hard with regards to confinement and the bordering of color and how we as a society imprison ourselves within the complexity of skin as if human survival depends on this one specific thing. Of course, I could make a con conscious effort to avoid color or not to invade your personal space when trying to make a parallelism. But history can be unforgiving in how the past reconstructs the future, whether we acknowledge it or not. For some reasons, I feel our histories and futures intersect in so much as we come from the same memory. In other words, I have inhabited the cell door claim, and I can't escape the image of the pinstripe inmate constructed. There it is, that word, construct, or construction, which is another word for confinement on someone else's terms, a sort of deliberate scaffolding. If I could go back to that initial moment after the formulation of Earth, and I'm talking about the first glorious sunrise after the Big Bang, have you ever wondered what that feeling could have been like? In the beginning, a delayed oceanic swirl, lack blue, foliage lack green, color had not begun. If only someone could have stopped progress at that precise moment. Consider the empirical evidence, a two-year-old baby boy in an apartment eight blocks from the detonation that killed four little girls in a church basement. All the girls wanted was to sing and somebody stole their little light of mine. The picture of baby Jesus knocked off the hook, a two-year-old boy being constructed to understand black and white to choose a side. I was a construction before I came of age. For, uh, for so long, all I could think about was vanishing from prison not realizing I was in prison before incarceration, and I still languish behind invisible bars. I keep asking if this is the totality of my life. True, I am on the outside, but my inside is tangled up still. If life is the sum of history, how can I ever hope to escape this? Whether I choose to acknowledge the box or not, other people will, and there is no escaping this distinction. In other words, allow me to paraphrase Sartre for a minute, who says that once man uttered the word free, man was no longer free because he needed to be identified as free, proving he was chained. I say I am free every day, but really, how free am I? Okay. And so this one, this letter is sort of one that sort of takes me back to this island called in North and called Eleuthera. They Luther, anybody have heard of the Lutheran Islands? So back in the day, in the 80s, it was a halfway fueling point for the, the Medellin cartel from South America. Right? And so that's where 
the drug thing came in, I met these two Haitian guys on the island, and they were um, drug runners for the Medellin. And so they sort of befriended me, and that sort of started that whole cycle. So when I went back to go work on this memoir, I actually went back um, to sort of get that ambiance and talk to some of the people. And I actually ran into one of my old friends, and so that appears at the end of this. It sort of talks about how all of this sort of started. So, how am I doing on time, okay? Um, it's five times, so. Okay. Maybe another 10 minutes, and then we'll do q and Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Hmm, let's see, let's see, let's see. Yeah, yeah. Dear L, because I promised, a change in locale allows us to understand there comes a moment before the defiance of gravity when the pilot pulls back the control levers commanding twin engines toward a horizontal plane of 15,000 feet. That is freedom without uttering a word. Fifteen years I've been away from the Luther but never stopped speaking the island's name. As we depart the edge of the United States, the Atlantic spills past the future we conceive. For an hour and 30 minutes, there is a continuous drone of propellers circling clockwise, propelling us. North Luther is a private island shaped like a scythe, white sand lining the uneven coast. When nothing changes, nothing changes. Landing onto the small tarmac, the same green foliage, a line of Cessnas, single and twin, the custom house that reads, Welcome to Eleuthera, all the same. Mario is a grown man now, the DNA image of his father Daniel, who died four years ago in an automobile accident on the main road that stretches 250 miles north to south. I was Mario age when I became friends with Daniel, his dad. Before heading to Dehatchet Bay, we grabbed two colleagues at the bar across from the terminal. Boy, I got Daniel R. Ferguson and him all the way. Drink first and talk later. On the road, I remember the sudden turns, the houses, the makeshift vegetables and fruit stand between two coconut trees and upper Vogue means make a left at Gregory Town. To the left, the dark blue rugged Atlantic, the seductive Caribbean to the right, crystal clear, and the current sedates you. If there is a heaven, a state of being where everything is copacetic, cool in the game, well, this is it. And for a moment, I can't inhale. Nothing changes. This I remember. The right from Gregory Town to Hatchet Bay is always the same. The pastel houses, the cottage bars, club, let me remember, and coral reef. We take a left at remember into a dog right curve, and then the panoramic view of the Caribbean Mat Matteo grew up with. The sun between thin gray clouds is ready to morph day into calm night. Hattie, Daniels, Hattie, Daniels' widow, hugs me like a mother and then hands me the keys to the small blue villa next to her house. An hour later, Matty and, and I walk the coral reef along the shore, much like his father and I did. The son has assumed the footsteps of the father. Dear L, please follow mine. So I'm going to skip a little bit um, toward the end. This morning, the knock comes unexpected since Matteo and I said our goodbyes before he went to his construction job on Harbor Island. Opening the door, the slightly heavyset man who has his forefinger and thumb pointed to like a gun squeezes the imaginary trigger and says, gotcha. I'm trying to construct the man's facial features into something recognizable, but I can't. Then I stare again and the man's face is focused and it's the same Haitian transplant with no shoes I met sitting on a giant turtle those many years ago in front of a small one-room house in Gregory Town. Franz Pantaleon has become a grown man, complete with receding hairline. We sit on the front steps of my apartment enjoying the sunrise over the bay. Franz is still a little cautious, guarded person. He tells me he never thought he would see me again. When I met France, he had an airplane, two cigarette boats, and a couple of fishing vessels. <clears throat> I never asked him how it all began, but sitting here now, with morning almost set, and, and, time, and, and time perhaps inconsequential, I ask. Franz leans back a bit like he's trying to remember. The 80s were the opening to a gateway of drugs flowing from Colombia to the United States. Franz was sitting in the front steps of his house when a guy came walking two large do dogs down the street. For some inexplicable reason, the man let go of the leash and the, dog, the dogs ran ahead and pounced on a pale man walking toward them. The man who let go of the leash kept walking past his attack dogs and then whistled. Getting up off the ground, the attack man grabbed the biggest boulder he could find by the bush, ran and hurled it. 
were coming down the street at that moment with the police and the boulder smashed the side window of the police car. The police had assumed the man was a trunk and wanted to take him to jail, except Franz came to his side explaining how the dogs and man that were now gone were the real culprits. The police let the pale man go, and Franz saw him coming down the street again the next day. This time, his brother was on the steps with him and says, that man keep telling me he got connections in South America, you know. You know, people say he can't a local, man. Franz ignored the local part, hopped off his steps and caught up to him. After talking a while, they went to a phone booth. Weeks later, Franz's brother was in Bogota when he found what he found was a 1,700 square foot warehouse with bricks of cocaine stacked to the ceiling. Shortly thereafter, Franz traveled down to Bogota because he could fly an airplane and knew the route to Eleuthera. The Colombian pilots could only get the plane to San Carlos. The, Colum the Colombians had a thousand kilos that needed to be moved to the States. Franz told them, that's your problem, not mine. In translation, what he was saying, if I transport these kilos, I get 500, half, bottom line. If the DEA catches me, they all belong to me, he said. Franz assumed the controls in San Carlos and made it to Haiti, the place of his birth, whose horseshoe mountain offered the gateway to Eleuthera. Once the plane glided low through the horseshoe, it would stay close to the water under radar detection. Once Franz came up the left coast, he made out the curve from James Siston leading to the cliff that forms the hatchet in Hatchet Bay. One thousand kilos wrapped in fiberglass were dropped in the water with his brother and a crew waiting in a boat. Franz, with the two other Columbia pilots in the cockpit, landed the plane in North Eleuthera. The custom officials cleared him and the guests. The rest, as they say, is history, history. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna end with something real short. Hmm. I'll read something from prison. I, might, I don't think I read anything. Um, yeah. Excuse me one second. Okay, here we go. Oh. Okay. The State, nineteen ninety eight. The reality of Roxbury Correctional, as with any prison, is rooted in the idea that you cannot leave by your own free will, the key word being free. Walking from intake into and across the prison yard, taking in the pristine lawns and clean sidewalks, you get a sense of false security. You could be visiting a gated liberal arts college in a rural town if not for the razor wire circling the complex, but the rot wireless snapping jaws immediately destroy this fantasy. A few Paces farther, and the guard tower comes into focus against the backdrop of a coat ball sky. You can't help but think about the index finger willing to squeeze the trigger, the scope, barrel, and mirror shades following every inmate's footstep. The first night, 11 p.m., lock-in, instigated a crippling silence in cell 16 until the doors rolled back at 4.30 a.m. for breakfast the first morning. Our cells emptied into a stream of human flesh migrating to, toward the dining hall, which was a hundred yards opposite the housing unit. Our bodies blended together effortlessly. We could have been a herd of cattle going to graze. Midway to the entrance, with the sun's orange peeking through dawn steel gray, a man moaned and dropped to the ground with a shank protruding from his stomach. Breakfast had to be eaten, so we each stepped over the bloody body. I was told it would take about two years before the judge would hear my motion for reconsideration. After I received the, the maximum five-year cap on four, calendar, four felonies, my court-appointed my court lawyer submitted the request before I was transported upstate. In the meantime, I tried to remember every bit of advice given to me in county jail by the old heads, the ones in and out of prison so frequently that they acquired by invaluable knowledge. Definite no-nos were don't borrow nothing from nobody. Don't jump the line, any line. Be respectful of the phone and the man's religion. Don't get caught in a lie. You steal and get caught, you can lose your life. Always keep your sneakers on because you may have to fight at any given moment. Don't fight fair. Don't get pumped. 
or you may be somebody's pump. I always keep a shank close by and don't be afraid to use it. If you are, again, you may lose your life. Rossbury Correctional Institution is located in Hagerstown, Maryland. It's flanked by stoic mountains rising from the east and west. Dairy farms add a certain presence as the wind whistles through the valley. The heaviest concentration of men were from Baltimore, which helps create the Washington-Baltimore divide. Both are fairly large cities with high crime and drug weights, rates. They are about 30 minutes apart by car, and within both inner cities there is an unwritten rule of competition. The unwritten rule in Rossbury dictated that I associate myself with Washington folk or risk being eaten alive by Baltimore. There were folks already in my housing unit who could vouch for my street cred and that I was a dude who played fair, as fair as one could in the cutthroat hustling game. This was a place where a reputation on the outside could help your status on the inside. My first cellmate, Debo, was from the district. Before we could get to any type of meaningful conversation, we performed the ritual of male bonding to see if each of us really knew the streets of D.C. like we claim. I could tell Debo was suspicious of me, but by the same token, I was suspicious of him. After small talk, the conversation turned to how dudes sold fake televisions in the box of unsuspecting victims over on Minnesota Avenue. Debo mentioned the Black Hole and Celebrity Hall hosting all the live go-go parties back in the day, and I concurred. We both reminisce about the heyday of Portland Avenue and the Jamaican Wars during the late 80s. This barrage of questions and answers continued until I was deemed legit. Six years into a 60-year sentence for a murder that occurred in Prince George's County, Debo rambled in a raspy voice about why he hated Baltimore dudes. Them jokers funny, homie. Can't trust them because most of them do fiends for their heroin. Don't expect them to have your back. No, nah, don't do that. If anything, they're going to light your ass up. Debo was 22 years old in the state of Maryland and tried to sentence him, had tried and sentenced him as an adult. He knew nothing about manhood but what he learned behind iron bars. The older inmates served as his role model and mentors, the closest thing to a father he would ever know. Roxbury is where he grew up and perhaps would die. The next day I moved across the hall in with Big Cheese in cell 17. Big Cheese was here on the drug possession charge and had two years ago before his release date. At the age of 32, he claimed he was tired and that the best way to get out of here early and alive was to hang with dudes who had something to lose. He told me that cats close to parole consider short time as meaning five years or less tended to stay out of trouble and not get involved in fights. For the next year, we would come to know each other's struggles. We would see things that we would never speak about. Again, night. A deafening silence filling every inch of the housing unit. Every stir amplified by the isolation of a closed cell door. The beat thump begins simple enough. That intense percussive call go-go, drawing on West African influence, the indigenous music of the District of Columbia. Two doors down in cell 19, Josephus got go-go fever induced by mail call after shift change. Five years into an eight-year bid, his girlfriend, who stayed in Clifton Terrace, informed him she would no longer visit the memory of his street heroics. His image had faded from D.C. landscape, and so was she. There was no question the right fist was ball, driving the cadence like a conductor calling out to a crew of Gandhi dancers laying eight-foot railroad track. Get a grip in your hand, whoa, nah, work with the children, whoa, nah. The left hand, palm open, balanced the driving narrative of gut-bucketed pain, much like a mauling does six-chin spikes into the cross ties. Let it swing on down, whoa, nah. A combination of spirituals, blues, work songs, and field hollers. Josephus bang, pulling each man to the edge of his bunk to listen to the coded message thumped on a metal desk doubling as a dehembe. For five minutes, he held us hostage with the same beat, the same goddamn beat, exhibiting how written language can kill the human spirit. Then he released us to a much faster, more complicated syncopation, the reverberated echo unique to each man's current temperament. So we each wallowed long and hard in their temperament. If it were not for the razor wire blocking him, Josephus would have broken into a sprint, scaled the fence, and evaporated into the known world. He couldn't. And in the process of this revelation, he concentrated hard on each individual thump, 
careful to press sovereign to the low note while the high one reprieved, offering everybody's C-tier testimony on how a woman done him wrong. Reality dictated that soon I too would get a Dear John letter from Beanie who had convicted, my girlfriend Beanie who had been convicted and sentenced to 18 months in Montgomery County. There was a helplessness in the way Josephus banged misery which receded as each minute elapsed. When the elegiac rhythm ceased, the slow drag boot heel of the night shift guard replaced <laughs> the vacated noise. She slowly made her rounds, pointing the flashlight into each cell to make sure everyone was present and accounted for. When the strong beam of light pierced into my cell, I was on the edge of my bunk with a roll of cigarette dangling from my lips. Thank you. All right. So we have some time for questions. So, would you like some water? Yeah, a little water. A little water. So, um, I understand that some of you have read the book um, during the class, and so, you know, I welcome all questions. Don't hold nothing back. I've already answered all of them, of course. <laughs> yes. Um, so you mentioned at the beginning that you wrote this in the form of an exchange of letters, and I just want to know what your thought process behind that decision, rather than writing it in a normal, just um, as a story. Well, you just told me, you just said that I don't like to write stuff normally. I, just, yeah. I don't like to no. do that. Well, no, I mean, you said, I mean, you kind of said it, but I know I was, I was working on the memoir, and I didn't, it was like reading in all these different, so, these different ways, and it was too, too straightforward, and it was really all about me, which I, you know, I kind of hate that. I mean, I don't, you know, for me, I'm just, ain't no like that. Um, so most of the time, my projects come fra very fragmented. They don't start out one thing and become that thing. I very rarely do that. And so what happened was, um, these letters never, I never thought about these letters for a while. But after about the 10th letter, um, that I would save them, and she would save them, we would save these, we would save our letters. Because um, I like, I think there's something to the process of letter writing. Like it is a very intense time. Like the intense, the time that we wrote was very intense, uh, very personal. Um, and it, it, you almost have to decompress from the letter writing, to be honest with you. And so, but, and I did send her, ex, you know, so it, it helped because I was working on this manuscript and I was like, check it out and tell me what you think about it, you know, because I, I didn't really have a whole lot of people looking at it right then. But I knew that we had came from some of the same places because I knew her. And in the process of that, you know, one of these, so what happened was, funny what funny thing, I read a book uh, called Erasure by Percival Everett. And so, you know, writers, good writers always steal stuff, right? So I'm looking. <laughs> and so this is fiction book that reads is sort of like a book within a book. So there's this narrative, and then within that narrative, there's a satirical narrative that builds off of the regular thing. So I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. Like, that sort of like, so I was like, what if I took these letters and and sort of like made the letters, so there's this conversation that's going back and forth because it's, it's touching on everything that we're going to we, 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 We're talking about the prison industrial complex, we're talking about the streets, we're talking about color, we're talking about books, we're talking about all of this stuff. And then, you know, it, it just sort of set up that way and that, and so because they, they did come in mail call. And so to recreate that became, the, you know, sort of became more interesting to me than just to have a, a memoir like it started here and then it ended there. Um, and so that's the, that was the whole process. Um, but the letter, it didn't, it didn't start out that way. It sort of morphed into that. And then if you notice, there's these journal notes. So, there, so there's, I used to keep this journal when I was on the train. And I, I wasn't staying in New York at the time. I was going to visit from Connecticut. So a lot of times, I would like, because I'm, I'm very fascinated with, with train travel and just stuff. Like, and so I would sit there and write these very intense lyrical prose things and so they became the journal notes that you see in the book right and so each journal note opens up a path opens up a memory or something it's, it, it sort of foretells what's to come so that's how it happened like that yeah i get you next here um you talk a lot about the emotional process and how writing the letters um reminded you of the things that have happened in your past can you talk a little bit about 
the decision to con to continue writing it despite despite the fact that it was a very emotional thing? Well, the letters were just one part of it. I mean, that was intense, but the memoir is intense too. Don't see? It still was an intense process because. With memoir, you know, first of all, you have, you, you have to remember it, and then as a writer, then you have to write it, and then as a good writer, you have to edit it. And so that's like an everyday process for years that you're living with this thing, you know. And, then, and, and so it might not be intense, but I think toward the end it got to be a little intense, and I realized that, A, that when I would go back into these spaces, it would kind of take me there for a minute, just for a second, and I would be like, I didn't like it. You know, um, I just didn't. But that's just the reality of it because you, saw, you, you get so caught up in the memory and trying to sort of realize what that meant. I didn't write any of this when I got out of prison. I mean, I wanted to wait a lot of time to understand what all of it, to process all of this. Like, what did, what did all of this really mean? Um, and so it, 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 it was the letters and then it was the process, the memoir, but even the, the process of going back and like editing, editing it and revisiting it over and over, you know, took, it takes a toll um, because you realize that you have to revisit those spaces intentionally or unintentionally. You, you go there, you know, and it's, it, it can sort of affect your moves and alter you, you know. And, for me, I caught it a lot because I, I could find myself in these in these moods, and I'm like, but I knew why because I had just like went back to somewhere where I thought I had left alone, like that dark place where you know stuff that you don't want to talk about. You know what I mean? It's like, shit. All right. Yeah. All right uh, why did you choose uh, the intro of the Open Book Festival as your first book? Well, because. I felt I had been going through levels of hell. I mean, when you go into places in terms of addiction and drug, drug, drug dens and places where people do all kind of unimaginable shit. Excuse my language, but that's just it. You know, some of this I talked about, some of it I, I didn't. But it still doesn't erase the memory. And so for me, I, I equate sometimes those levels into to Dante's you know, journey into these sort of levels of, of hell. And you enter one and you leave, you, if you leave one and you enter another one. You leave the world of addiction, of addiction and you enter the world of homelessness, right? So, and then the, the things that you see within those levels, like, it just seemed to me, you know, that, that and the invisible man, and Ralph Ellison's invisible man is like, the two single, is like the two things that sort of relate to, but with Ralph Ellison, the Invisible Man more so. If you've ever read that book, you know, the protagonist is like, you know, always going through all these things and doesn't really understand how the world is playing him until it, you know, until it almost gets too late, right? So, yeah. Well, sometimes it's usually the dialogue or a memory. Yeah, or it's either dialogue or a memory or something just for emphasis, just totally. But most, most times it's usually a continuation of dialogue, but it's an interior dialogue. That's what it is, yeah. Yeah, I'm so, yeah. Yeah, I come over here. What was it like asking Elle to use her letters? Oh, my God. <laughs> 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 First time I asked if she was still locked up. <laughs> she was like, hell no! <laughs> she was like, oh no, no. It took a long time. No, it took about a year, man. What are you talking about? It took a long time. You know, and first time she was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> then, you know, um, but she always, you know, and, and she was always asking me how the memoir was going. I was like, it's going okay, but I really think this is the form. And then I had to talk, I had to really talk her into it. And so that's why you see Elle, because it, when the book came out, she was in the process of being published, she was still incarcerated. And so the, 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 the specifics around why she was locked up, she didn't want her name, that was part of it too. So that was a huge part of it as well. Um, but after, you know, we begin to think, well, she, be, you know, just think about it for a while. It's something that, you know, that. You know, you ask someone to do something huge, like share some of your life with this thing that I'm doing. You know, even though it's mine, you, it's, I never forget that she contributes. That's why I always, you know, make sure that people understand that there's, 
someone who contributed to this, but more so the reason I wanted to put L in this book is because if you look at the way, sort of like how we, sort of the narrative and incarceration, you rarely see women doing what I do and what some of these other guys out here doing in terms of being able to have that platform. You don't see that. It's not enough. It's not enough at all. I, I know it's not. Because I work it out. I'm here all the time. And so it was sort of a way to sort of like get that voice in there. You know, here's the thing that I noticed about, about women incarceration and men. When, when you go visit the men on visiting day, you can't stand in a room only. When you go see the room, there's plenty of room to run around. That tells you everything you need to know. Okay? So, you know, in terms of that, um, yeah, so, yeah. I'm not going to say a whole lot of, but she was so, the, 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 I'm not, you know, the, you, you can talk, you can read, if you read the book, you understand that she was got locked up with 32 kilos of cocaine, right? So she was giving a ride to somebody who didn't tell her that the stuff was there. So the, the federal authority, they knew that she didn't have anything to do with that. But because of her past record, they held it against her. And the only thing that she could say was that this guy knew somebody in Philly that they, you know, that was the only connection, like this one thing. And so they kept her for four years until, they, she, until that happened. And, and um, her son was two when she went in. So, you know what I mean? So it's like, it's like these things happen, man, and people don't understand like the way this justice system weighs down on you sometimes unnecessarily and don't take those things into consideration in terms of like what people have a life, man. So that was weighing her on her too in terms of a lot of things. But in the end, you know, it became a good vehicle for her to sort of do what she needed to do in the world. So I'm very happy for that. You know, she's been able to use, take that platform and go back to school and do some other things. And so, you know, hopefully it'll work out like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, you talk about your family in the memoir. What was their reaction to you publishing? Well, <laughs> it was cool. My family's fine with it. You know, my, my dad's my, my, one of my biggest supporters, so he was always one, of the, you know, pushing for it. My mom, she's sort of indifferent about things, uh, but <laughs> she just is. <laughs> but, I mean, I think, you know, for me it wasn't as, you know, the family stuff was cool, you know. I think we all came to a place a long time ago where we had to come to, like, they had to come to grips with, like, the things I had done. And I had to forgive myself for the things I had done to them. And we got there, but it was hard, you know. But we, you know, so by the time, you know, when I, came, when I got out and sort of started doing, turning my life around, we, all those things came together. And so um, they're my biggest supporters. So it, it wasn't that I'm giving some, some, some kind of family secret away or like, and that's, that's the part of it. Like everybody has this stuff going on in their life. They don't want to talk, they don't talk about them. You know, my dad would have these, his friends and their sons would be going through some, some, something similar in some kind of way, but they would never talk about it. They would never open up and say, hey, this is going on with my son too. See what I'm saying? So he sort of broke out of that and saw that. It was like, no, I'm going to I'm gonna embrace it so I can help somebody else maybe who's going through that in terms of a parent. So it's been that, that kind of, you know, I will say, you know, I was doing some readings in Alabama and I took him along with me, you know, so it was, it was very cool to have him riding shotgun. I went to the Alabama State, North Alabama, um, University of North Alabama, and uh, a couple, one other place. Um, and it's sort of, there's a piece in there, if you read the book, that calls Father Forgive Me. And that's probably the hard, I don't read that one a lot. I just can't. And I read it for, I read it with him there that time. That was like the hardest thing ever. Like, oh Jesus. Uh, but I don't, I leave that one long a little bit. I can, I do, I have read it, but it's, I don't really read it that much. So that's the one, that's the one piece that's sort of like the piece that I kind of stay away from. But it, it was the most gut-wrenching getting back to, I think, what she had talked about emotionally. That was the most gut-wrenching one to write and to go over and because, you know, I can remember the courtroom scene just like it was yesterday and like um, wondering if I was going to get a second chance or whether I going to go back to prison. And then, you know, you got people that sort of been loving you and you ain't been loving them back, but they still there for you. And, you know, they, they, they stand there before someone begging, begging somebody else that they don't even know to like give, give their child a second chance. Like, and then so it becomes this thing, you know, you almost get trans, like, you, it's an out-of-body experience. For me, it was out-of-body because I, was, I can, you know, see everything. And um, it's just one of those things that took forever to write. It probably was the last piece I wrote. 